Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Katie Raleigh, and I am the Outreach Librarian for the NOAA Central Library. I'm very happy to bring you to our seminar today. First, a few logistics. As an attendee, you are muted. So if you do have a question or a, a technical issue, you can reach out through the question panel in the GoToWebinar uh, sidebar that you have there. Those questions that you ask, I'm gonna hold on to those until the end of the presentation, but feel free to drop those questions in throughout the presentation, wherever you have it, so you don't forget it, and I will ask them in the order as those questions come in. Um, if you do have a technical issue, you can, of course, uh, ask me through the, the question or chat panels, but most issues like not being able to hear uh, the speakers or being able to see the slides uh, will be solved if you X out of the whole program and use that same join link to rejoin. That'll solve most of your issues. Okay, we are also recording today's seminar, so if you do need to uh, step away or you wanted to share this with a colleague, we will have this recorded and up on the library's YouTube channel after the fact. So I want to uh, welcome you all to a uh, collaboration between the NOAA Ex Ocean Exploration Office and the NOAA Central Library, Transforming Underwater Sampling and Manipulation with Soft Robotics. I'm going to turn it over to Liang Wu to introduce our speakers today. Thank you very much, Katie. And welcome everyone to the NOAA Science Seminar Series, to the seminar, Transforming Underwater Sampling and Manipulation with Soft Robotics. This NOAA Science Seminar, as mentioned by Katie, is co-hosted by NOAA Ocean Exploration and the NOAA Central Library. My name is Liang. I am a Canals Marine Policy Fellow working in the Science and Technology and Outreach and Education Divisions of NOAA Ocean Exploration. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our seminar speakers, Dr. Stephen Licht and Dr. Brandon Phillips from the University of Rhode Island Department of Ocean Engineering. Dr. Stephen Licht's research group at the University of Rhode Island, or URI, develops and deploys technologies for underwater surface and aerial platforms used in marine applications. His current work focuses on mechanical systems and control algorithms to enhance the capabilities of systems with low logistics footprints. Dr. Lake received a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Yale University and a PhD in Mechanical and Oceanographic Engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution Joint Program. Prior to joining URI in 2013, Dr. Lake was a principal research scientist with the iRobot Corporation. Dr. Brandon Phillips specializes in the development and application of novel instrumentation for oceanographic research. His current research topics include low light imaging of deep sea biology and bioluminescence, soft robotic manipulators, hydraulic systems, distributed sensing, and low cost lightweight methods for ocean exploration. Dr. Phillips received his Bachelor of Science in Ocean Engineering from ULI a Master of Science in Oceanography from the University of Connecticut, and a PhD in Oceanography from URI's Graduate School of Oceanography. Dr. Lake and Dr. Phillips' project was supported via our Ocean Exploration Fiscal Year 2018 funding opportunity. Thank you very much, both professors, for your precious time to share with us your exciting work. The floor is yours. All right, well, well, thank you so much for that, that kind introduction, and, and thank you for hosting us. Uh, it really is, uh, you know, it's, we're, we're faculty members, so we like to talk, we like to get our research out there, and we like to talk about the, the fun stuff that we do. Um, so this is really a, a lovely opportunity. Uh, and of course, thank you to the you know, Office of Exploration for funding this work. It's really, uh, it's been nice to be able to collaborate uh, with folks at NOAA uh, and try and uh, push this stuff forward. So um, as you heard, both uh, Professor Phillips and I, um, have a variety of wide variety of interests, but this happens to be one of those areas where, where we, we coalesce around a, a single a topic that is of great interest to both of us. We share a number of students, our labs are sort of next door to each other. So this has been a, a great fun to work on with them. So Brendan, I, you, you want to say a few words before I get started? I can Oh sure, yeah. Um I I, I, I echo everything that that Stephen said. Um a lot of this stuff wouldn't get funded without the sort of forward vision from NOAA Ocean Exploration, so thanks for that. 
Um, and I think I'll probably get a little bit more introduction to my lab halfway through the presentation, but um, we got a really great group of people in here, but I got a quick shout out to Monique, a good friend who I can see in the chat there. So um, looking forward to this. Okay, Stephen, why don't you go off? All right, so uh, the, the structure here is, uh, we've, uh, again, we work very closely together, but we've kind of divided this roughly into two parts um, to, to reflect the, the different aspects of this work we've worked on. But the, the overall context for what we're trying to do here is uh, the recognition that there are an enormous number of uh, sort of targets or, or, or objects that we want to interact with on the seafloor in the mid-column or, or essentially at sea that we don't know go ahead of time what their shape is, what their composition is, uh, whether they're fragile, whether they're brittle, uh, whether they're hard, whether they're soft. And yet we still want to be able to sample them or capture them in some way. And, and as uh, I imagine a number of people on this call are aware, the, uh, the cost of actual operations at sea is, is so enormous that the, the faster you can iterate on the ability to um, create a, an, an, a manipulator or a sampler that you can then use uh, while you're at sea, uh, the better off you are in terms of the, the time and energy required. And one of the, the, the fields that sort of really took off, I would say maybe seven, eight, maybe 10 years ago in, in robotics in general, particularly terrestrial robotics, was the idea of soft robotics. As it became more possible to print and create and manufacture things on a lab scale, sort of a benchtop scale to create uh, molds for soft structures, people started to say, well, can we create objects that can, uh, you know, like an elephant's trunk or uh, a biologically inspired, a lot of biologically inspired efforts to create soft robots or soft body or flexible or compliant robots, which can interact with the environment much more effectively, potentially, than the rigid, hard, uh, grasping, sort of cutting uh, metallic robots that we're used to uh, uh, or generally have been in the past. And a lot of effort has been expended on soft robotics for terrestrial and aerial applications. But one of the things that people have difficulty overcoming is the fact that these uh, materials tend to be uh, quite dense. They're a lot heavier than air. Uh, and yet, because they're soft and they're compliant, they're not inflexible, they're not able to support themselves particularly well. This is why you don't have massive slugs wandering around uh, the world. On the other hand, if you go underwater, you suddenly realize that, that you're surrounded by a high density medium. And a lot of the materials we use to create these soft robotics are about as dense as the water that they're in. So a whale is sort of an enormous animal that effectively weighs nothing because it's neutrally buoyant. Uh, and this has uh, driven a lot of the effort uh, in soft robotics in general. And there's been, there's been efforts from, from Stanford creating uh, compliant grippers on the end of uh, diver-like uh, robotic systems uh, to uh, systems that are almost entirely uh, flexible, squid-like or, or octopus-like uh, structures, such as you see on the, the right here uh, with uh, Santana and Biorobotics Institute in Italy. Um, there's a lot of work that's been gone into creating single fingers that can wrap around objects. And, and in our lab as well, we've done some work in the past uh, with this, what we call uh, universal grip. So that sort of, I, I hope, sets the table a little bit, which is that we're operating in a, in a very dense fluid, which allows us to create uh, structures that we can never imagine using that are soft uh, that we'll be able to use in air. At the same time, that, that softness, that flexibility gives us the opportunity to interact with things without crushing them or destroying them at first contact. So I'm gonna talk about uh, largely about two different types of uh, uh, jamming compliant grippers. I just actually realized that because I'm on a call here, I can I, I have a, a uh, uh, show and tell object here, which I'll play around a little bit. Uh, this is a, a jamming gripper and, and a couple of finger grippers. Uh, Brendan will talk more about the finger grippers. And it, these uh, grippers come in a sort of a universal uh, just a bag that will wrap around anything and grab it, and a hybrid uh, uh, style, which has some sort of backing, some sort of rigid uh, connection that allows it to, to shape around things more um, aggressively. Uh, we'll it, talk about the pressure. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to interrupt you real quick. I'm sorry. Could you go back to the, not the last slide, but the one right before? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was just thinking to preface this for this audience, I, I can tell. Uh, you know, a number of these folks have a, a, a deep experience with, with, with deep sea robotics. Mm -hmm. So they're probably familiar with that central image that you have in there of a standard deep sea manipulator. It's grabbing a soft jamming gripper, of course, but that, that sort of heavy metal manipulator system that's there. And, and what I like to say to students is that there's a historical precedence for the technology being developed for heavy duty applications underwater. So if you're going to do underwater construction, 
option if you're going to work on oil and gas, which is really where a lot of the, uh, the commercial market is for developing this technology. They need these heavy duty, large industrial manipulator systems for doing whatever work they're doing underwater. And for decades, we as scientists adopted that technology because it was somewhat off the shelf, uh, something that we didn't have to invent ourselves. But soft robotics allows us a, a new pathway to sort of reinvent and rethink how we do grasping and manipulation and sampling underwater. So it, it, it totally diverges from the standard, you know, commercial oil and gas industry. Uh, and, and, and we're trying to reach towards those same capabilities, but that in ways that they can do better things uh, or science better. Maybe that's a better way to say it. So um, I just wanted to kind of like ground a lot of this as, as a divergent uh, pathway towards towards manipulation than what is normally done. Absolutely. And, and as you'll see, as we talk through this, I tend to come to this from a sort of a classical robotics, what can I make robots do uh, perspective. Uh, my time at iRobot was, you know, largely uh, working with uh, some ground robots. And uh, Brennan comes up with much more uh, deep domain knowledge in terms of the, the deep water operations and sampling. So it's been a nice conversation that way. So um, you'll probably hear that from the focus in, in what we talk about. Um, but I, I wanted to, one of these images that I showed on that slide that Brennan had you walk back to is, is actually from uh, um, Galloway et al. It's a group up at Harvard that uh, Brennan and I uh, worked with. Uh, this is before the OER project, uh, worked with pressure driven fingers. And this is a, a fairly, uh, at this point, well known technology where essentially you have a, uh, a geometry, I have one, I'm holding one right here actually, where there's a cavity inside this object. And if I pressurize it from here, uh, it will try to expand, but it can only expand by bending because one surface or some part of it is 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 not cannot extend. So this top surface can extend as kind of a bellows action, and this bottom surface can't. So it will bend to be pressurized. So there were part of what we've done in this work is, or a large part of the focus of this work was to combine those two uh, types of grippers. So I'm going to talk about the first type of gripper and just give you a sense of how that works and what it means, uh, and we'll go from there. Um, so in in 2010. Um, uh, Brown et al. came up with this idea of what they call a universal jamming gripper. And the idea was that if you can, if you look at a, a, a vacuum packed uh, block of, of ground coffee, for instance, you have essentially a rigid block that when you, uh, when you allow air into that, that ground coffee mix, it will it'll become sort of more compliant uh, and, and softer. Um, and essentially the, the, the components of that are that you have a membrane, in this case I have a, just a, this is a rubber party balloon or a latex party balloon. Uh, and inside it, uh, they're just uh, a, a particles or granules. Uh, in this case, they're just plastic pellets. Right? And the idea is that if you have an object, uh, you don't know the shape or, or size of it exactly, you can bring the, I'll turn it this way, maybe it'll be a little clearer, you can bring the gripper down onto it in a softened shape like this, and it will form around it, it'll deform around the object. And then you can evacuate the air, and I'm gonna do it, I actually have tried this out a little earlier, so I think it'll work. I've got a, a syringe here, and I'm gonna, Pull on the syringe to evacuate the, the water. It's actually full of water, and water will come into here. And what you'll see, not work, is that the uh, uh, you can actually see the granules in here as it's become rigid around that shape. So in, in essence, what you're doing is you're deforming something around an object, creating exactly the right size gripper or shape gripper, and then you can manipulate. And this uh, this worked great if you're picking stuff up from above. Um, and we thought, well. What drives this, which makes this a, uh, it gives a strength to the rigid, to the rigid uh, 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 mode, is the pressure difference between internal and external. We thought to ourselves, this is when we first started this work, well, you know what, if you go deep underwater, the deeper you get, the bigger the pressure differential you can get between the outside and the inside. So we thought, well, this would, be, this would work great underwater. So we uh, actually had a, a robot donated from iRobot, where it used to work. This is just a little video array, a little uh, uh, remotely operated vehicle, but about yay big. Um, we, took a, one of these compliant jamming grippers, which again is just a party balloon, uh, full in this case, I think of sand. And I will say that if you order a large quantity of party balloons under a university purchasing contract, people start to ask questions. Um, we have a little camera so you can see what's going on. And we thought, well, we'll just dump this in one of our tanks and try and pick up objects off the floor. Uh, and we were actually shocked at how successful it was just with this, this sort of silly little prototype. Uh, so to give you an example, I have a video here of uh, this uh, structure, this gripper, attempting to pick up a washer off the bottom of the floor. So this is just a little you know, rusted uh, fender washer. And I'll, I'll run through it. Uh, maybe I'll run through it twice, but basically from the beginning, what you can see is that it, it approaches in a sort of blown up shape, so it's compliant. 
and rests down onto that washer. It's going to shape itself around it, and then when you when you fly the ROV up off the ground, you've got it in hand, and then you can release it just by reversing that uh, pressurization. Now we can do this with zip ties. Uh, we did this with aluminum rods, with aluminum rings, and, and so on and so forth. And the whole idea here was, well, it doesn't matter what we're picking up. We should be able to grab it as long as it's about the right, uh, uh, about the right size for what we're after. And a big, a big uh, thing we wanted to say early on was that you can do this without really affecting the, without having a uh, dramatic effect on the object itself. So uh, in this case, we say, well, one way of testing that in a very visceral way is, what do we take? This is actually a dirt clump. This is sort of a loosely conglomerated dirt clump uh, and a, a handheld gripper that we're going to lower on top to try and pick it up and keep its shape. So I'll play this video here for you, or at least I'll try to. Here we go. So this is the gripper. You can actually see that membrane is, it is full of sort of a sand material in there. It's lowered down on top of it and will evacuate the uh, fluid from, I think these jump, little jump scare on the, the thing there, picked it up. And then when you put it back down again, we'll, we'll push the air back into it. We did this nice and slow, as you can imagine, because it's a dirt clot. And it sort of peels itself up off over. And then to just to show you that this is in fact, uh, just a loosely conglomerated thing, we just dropped a small weight on it to uh, uh, so that's, you know, any pressure on this would be enough to, uh, to destroy it. So we, we felt really confident about this. We were very excited about this idea, um, but we got a number of questions. One of which was, well, what if you wanted to pick something up that isn't sitting on the ground? What if you wanted to pick things up that were sitting on mud and substrates and so forth? So we, we continued down this path of developing the grippers, but we moved to what we call our, our hybrid design, where we're not just lowering a gripper. So this is essentially a universal jamming gripper here that I'm holding my hand, which I can lower onto something and that works just fine. But we'd like to be able to take it horizontally, combine it with another gripper and the sort of clamshell approach, and then, then grab anything you want, uh, and then do essentially the same thing. So you have a, a, a nice shape around the object and then it uh, hardens up. So this is the, the, the current hybrid design that we have that's which funded under this uh, program. And there are a couple of aspects of this that are of interest. One is we have these, uh, these fingers, which help to shape it. Uh, and the other is that uh, it, we confront the problem of, of only being able to do stuff from above by the fact that we're, we're in water. So I can, we can dig into this a little bit. Uh, if you, this is the, the full shape here and we can disassemble one of these grippers, actually both of these grippers, and you can see there's a lot of complexity to the fluid pathways that are required to make this work. So in the, uh, in the first uh, go around on this, we had a lot of tubes and, and, and sort of structure, tube structure coming in to actually a manifold here. We'll talk, uh, Brennan will talk a little bit more about 3D printing, but this is a, a pressure proof uh, manifold that was 3D printed out of a, uh, using a SLA printing. And we have inputs, and the equivalent on this uh, device here is we have inputs uh, that are just quick disconnects that allow us to connect uh, tubing to both manipulate these fingers, make these fingers curve and bend and, and grasp, and to suck fluid out of the membrane itself. Um, there's a, a bit of a, 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 a subtlety to this, which is that uh, you actually, when you when you pull the fluid out of the, the membrane, it will retract a little bit. So there needs to be some sort of means of, of keeping that in contact with the object. And we've accomplished this with a, uh, a system that's actually two rolling diaphragm uh, membranes. We're, we might talk a little bit about rolling diaphragms in the near future, but um, that, they're actually connected to another rolling diaphragm so that uh, you have a soft fluid sort of pressure pulling, the, pushing the, the two clamshell grippers in. Uh, as you grasp things. So that's the sort of a hydraulic linear spring, which uh, is a really interesting concept that comes actually from a Disney uh, engineer, uh, Disney what's it, Imagineering lab. The, the other thing that I mentioned was this idea of neutral buoyancy. On land, if I want to use a gripper, I have to use it from above. I can't use it from the side because all the, the fluid and the, the structure will just will, will drain. Uh, after much effort and probably a year of trying different materials uh, to find something that was a particle that was neutrally buoyant so we could maintain that shape with something as soft as these fingers so that we could grasp from the uh, sides, uh, we actually discovered that uh, for you know, 20 bucks, 30 bucks of, for 10 pounds, uh, we can buy HDP or high density polyethylene pellets, um, which are the pellets that are used for, your, um, for a hacky sack or a cornhole. Uh, uh, bean bag basically. So bean, bean bag pellets turn out to be the very best medium uh, and they're nice and cheap, which is great. We were using all sorts of uh, uh, expensive oil drilling uh, 
lubricant beads and so forth that so we're getting in, in small cans for 100 bucks a pop. This is much better uh, and is much more effective. So after all that, just to give you a sense of, of whether and how this works, uh, we ran some, some quick experiments in essentially a shipping container with a, uh, an arm sled. Uh, this is, uh, give you a sense, this is not a, uh, it's not a sophisticated arm sled. This is a one degree of freedom at a time uh, on off joint control. So we, we had very limited control in order to pick the, the various objects up, but we wanted to we sort of embrace that as a problem as, as a reason to, to, to try it with the system. So I'll, I can, I'll, I guess I'll run through a couple of videos here. Um, picking up uh, everything from a wine glass, it's a little hard to see. There's actually a GoPro inside a wine glass in this top left-hand corner. Uh, and this is the view of the GoPro uh, in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, picking up a sharp metal object just to show that the, the balloon itself when it's not inflated is not, it's not uh, prone to ripping. Uh, and this one, uh, after talking with Brennan a little bit, he was very interested in picking up, um, grabbing living organisms. This is actually a, a deflated water balloon. So it's a balloon full of water that we were trying to pick up with a variety of um, balloon-like objects. Uh, so I can show, uh, just to give you a sense of what it looks like when we, when we do this grasping. This is in the un, uh, unjammed. And then it'll go from an unjammed compliant uh, mode to a jammed mode. Um, I guess it's running on both of these at once. And you can see the fluid, it's, it's we signed up the speed this went up, but you'll see the fluid actually is, is coming out and you begin to see the pellets themselves um, as it goes into that jam state. So you can see this, this bumpiness is actually the pellets uh, that you can see. Uh, we should start to see it on this one as well, and then we can pick it up uh, quite easily uh, without without damaging the uh, wine glass. So you can actually see this from the inside of the wine glass. It conforms quite well to it. It's essentially just wrapping a, a deflated balloon around it. And then as the fluid is evacuated from that balloon, you begin to see, maybe you're patient, if we're patient, uh, we begin to see uh, the, the uh, pellets coming through and that that sort of bumpy shape there is now it's in this rigid state and it's you know, it's perfectly grasped around that online glass um, and you can see because it's so compliant here it can also find its way around that balloon without squeezing it too hard to blow it up so uh, just a, these were just a couple of videos to give you a sense of uh, what's possible uh, we also a couple of if you zoom in really close we can take a look at this is one of the first objects we tried grasping which is just a an eighth inch hex key um, we had to float it so we could grab it in this case, but you can see that it's it's fully encased essentially in that uh, in the grasp uh, from that point. Let's see. Uh, one uh, important aspect of this too is when it's in its rigid state, it is actually rigid. It's not just a it's not sort of droopy and, and a little bit compliant. It's rigid enough that it can support. Uh, a, this is a, a large metal object that can actually su uh, supplies a fair amount of torque, and it would, it would try and uh, rip itself out of the, the grasp, but weren't held securely in there. So, um, we've also picked up very large rocks. Uh, uh, I, this one I'm showing just because you can actually see the way that when we when we pull off of this uh, PVC tube, you can see the shape uh, embedded inside that, uh, that gripper. So I hopefully that gives a real good sense of, of, of exactly the sort of mechanism by which this work and. What we actually discovered, and this is it's sort of difficult to publish when what you're trying to say is um, anything that we could fit between this thing we could grab. We really didn't have a, a, a failure rate. It was, there was always a way that you could, could grab everything that you wanted to grab. Everything from a, a gallon of water to a, a large rock to water balloons was, uh, was capable of what uh, we could grab. Um, now, one of the things that you'll, you'll see on, on all these images and that you'll see in what I'm holding here is that we have uh, these gripper fingers. I haven't talked a lot about it because we largely use them in this case to just create a curve that could generally shape things. But one of the things that Brennan's going to talk to you about is the difference between this, which uh, takes a long time to make, and this, which takes a lot less time to make, and, and how that's going to affect how we develop these systems going forward. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it off to Brennan. Uh, Thank you, Stephen. Um, yeah, so I, I'm going to go off on a couple different tangents, but focus mostly on using additive manufacturing for these systems that we've been developing. Um, just a brief introduction. I don't have good, I didn't prepare good slides that compare different types of 3D printing, but I'll verbally describe them to you. Um, a number of people are probably familiar if you've seen a 3D printer. The one that's kind of the most vanilla flavored around the world the most is, is something called an FDM or FFF printer, which is essentially what I describe as being a hot glue gun on a gantry. So it takes 
filament of plastic, it melts it, and then moves around in, 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 a, in a pre programmed manner. Um, and it, it cools and hardens uh, in layers, right? And it sort of builds up apart as you go. And then another method we've been employing is, is, is SLA 3D printing, stereolithography, which, which Stephen alluded to earlier, um, which is entirely different. It uses a photopolymer material. So it's like a bath of resin uh, that reacts to light and hardens. So UV cure, if anybody has done a surfboard repair or something, that's a photopolymer, something that starts as a liquid and becomes solid when it's exposed to uh, a particular wavelength of light. So SLA 3D printers take advantage of that by having a resin bath and then using a laser, which they can control using a, gal a galvo, to selectively cure uh, voxels, okay, uh, volume pixels. And then it does that in layer after layer after layer and builds it up. Um, the key differences, I would say, between the two, they both can produce hard and flexible materials. Um, the SLA 3D printing allows us to print in much higher resolution with much better pr material properties, particularly with the rigid materials. Whereas we found the FDM and FFF material stuff, uh, again, that hot glue on the gun on the gantry, uh, we found that lower cost and uh, you know simpler is better. Those are actually really good at, print at printing these flexible soft actuators. And so the image you see in front of you right now is actually combining, it's, it, what you're seeing are three 3D printed soft actuators that were produced using an FDM printer. Uh, and then they are valved together with a, with a rigid manifold uh, produced with an SLA 3D printer. So we, we mix and match. We have all these stuff here at URI that we work with. Um, and our students are better than us at running them. But uh, you know we're, we're kind of like dialing in on the methods here. And I'll, I'll kind of just you know sh look under the hood a little bit of how that goes. So next slide, please. Stephen, could you advance? Oh, sorry, I just realized. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call you out every time. Sounds good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, so as you can tell, we've, we've been 3D printing a lot of our stuff, as I just said. Uh, this work actually got kicked off by a colleague of ours up at Harvard, a, a, you know, a partner, friend lab, uh, led by Rob Wood. Uh, and he has a, uh, an engineer and his staff named uh, Daniel Vaught. So he's the lead author in this paper on the left that we're, uh, at least I'm a co-author on that one. Uh, Dan Vaught went to see, it was an OER sponsored cruise out into the far Western Pacific uh, to do some coral sampling. Uh, and that's as far as I can go. There was a much larger scientific goal there, uh, but they didn't know what size corals they might interact with. And so Daniel reached out to me and he said, hey, can I take a 3D printer to see and maybe make this stuff there? And I said, let's give it a shot. You know, I, I didn't get to go on the trip, but uh, helped guide him there. And sure enough, there was a great paper that came out uh, as a result of that, where they adaptively went on a ROV dive and said, well, there's this that looks this large, and we want to grab it. And overnight, he was able to uh, produce a new design on the boat that went down at depth, thousands of meters deep the next day to actually uh, uh, collect those, uh, those specimens. So Daniel really kind of paved the way and led a roadmap that, yes, you can 3D print your actuators, and you can do it on a boat, and you can do it pretty quick. Um, and that was really neat. So uh, moving forward, we've been taking that type of approach to print, print the actuators that you see on the right, but in a much more controlled fashion and a much more uh, scaled up fashion. We want to move beyond the actuators that are the size of our finger and move towards things that are larger than our own arm. Okay, And that's, again, coming back to the commercial manipulator type approach. We're trying to get to that same level of performance uh, but using the soft actuators. So, you know, we're, we're, we're already doubling the size of the actuators using 3D printers there. Uh, next slide. Thanks. Um, and then a bit more practical, but it's really neat, especially if you're into hydraulics, which I am, uh, <laughs> background and that sort of stuff. Uh, Stephen's uh, discussion about jamming grippers showed this device on the left you can see here with basically 3D printed, those white 3D printed boom arms, and then there are hoses running around the outside of it back up to a hydraulic system that's driving that. Uh, that can be greatly simplified, as we discovered, by directly 3D printing manifold and, and uh, fluidic pathways into the part itself. And so the part on the right, which isn't fully set up, I apologize, this is actually one of the only good images we had on hand of it, but that's that same boom arm on the left side, but with fluidic inputs and, and pathways integrated into it. And so all those hoses that you see there in that image, they go away. Uh, if anybody's taken a moment to look at a hydraulic uh, manifold or maybe possibly even designed one of their own, 
if you're going to make that using traditional machining methods, you're limited to right angles, way the, ways that you can drill a hole this way, seal it off, and then reach that hole from another way, you know, and attach your valve packs and all that sort of thing to it. With a 3D printer, the options are, are, are limitless. I mean, you can make pathways that go in all kinds of crazy corkscrews and different turns uh, in, in different angles in, in ways that, I mean, maybe they're not impossible to produce uh, with a traditional manufacturing method, but they sure would cost a lot of money. Uh, and take some very special uh, machinists to do that. So uh, the 3D printer kind of opens up a lot of uh, uh, options for us in terms of making our systems more streamlined and optimized. Uh, next slide. And then when it comes to the actuators, um, really we learned how to make these things uh, working with the folks up at Harvard. I think they kind of paved some of the first steps of this, right? And then we improved upon it ourselves. Uh, the, the, the idea there with the original way soft actuators were made was to 3D print molds. Okay, so you're leveraging 3D printing to make a complex mold, but then you're working through the steps of what the mold has to look like and then pouring in flexible rubber silicone, often in different layers, maybe with integrated um, strengthening members like that red ribbon you can see in here. And so making one of these actuators becomes, uh, I mean, I'll make it up, something like a week long process sometimes. You know, maybe over a weekend you have some things curing, you know, try it again the next week. Um, and so the pathway to development and, and iteration is very slow. The mold didn't work out. We have to reprint the mold and start over. We got the right mold, but we missed this step um, in, the, in the pouring process or the cure didn't work out. We're set back several days here. And what we really want to get to is the point where we can design something on a computer in CAD, model its behavior, know how it's going to behave, and then hit the 3D print button and it comes out, done. And we have achieved that. So we're going from that 12 step process, thank you, to doing the modeling steps ahead of time. Okay, so these are dynamic models, not just the static uh, uh, drawing, but actually seeing how they behave under internal pressure. And I, I will say we're holding back a little bit on the results here because we have a, a PhD student who's producing those right now. But um, I will just say his models are extremely uh, successful. They're really good. Um, everything that he models, they print out and they behave pretty much exactly the way he thinks. Uh, and they're more complex than you see here. But just so the tip of the iceberg is that we're able to take those 3D models and then run them in an FDM printer. That's that center image right there, uh, laying out a first layer, build print, stop the first layer. <laughs> and then uh, on the right hand, we have this nice cross section showing you what's capable in a standard FDM printer. So if anybody's uh, you know familiar with the types of printers out there, this is off of a Prusa printer, which is like a $700, uh, very uh, uh, Ford focused type 3D printer. So it's not fancy, it's something you could have in your basement. Um, and we're able to produce some very high quality, precise results uh, with these internal cavities and everything integrated into it. Uh, and the material cost is, it's, it's, it's almost nil, you know, by the kilogram, it's 20 bucks a kilogram or something. So each actua actuator is, you know, a dollar a piece or something like that. Um, and then the lower image is the only one I could find of that, but we have done a bunch of experiments using the fancy printers, the SLA 3D printers that we have here. Uh, they can print elastic, flexible materials that have some really interesting material properties. And we went at producing these bellows, which in a minute you'll see what those are used for. So those are, uh, believe it or not, bellows are, they, they look simple, but they're not. <laughs> there's, a, there's a whole bunch of interesting, uh, uh, design science uh, and engineering that goes into um, bellows, how many convolutions, how big, how wide, you know, what type of materials are used and that sort of thing. So we decided to go on a run using the fancy printers for those bellows, which we're successful with, but we have stopped because we don't like the smell. The material that's used in those printers, it just stinks. <laughs> There's just a lot of off-gassing from it. So um, we, we, we found some other workarounds uh, that, 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 that um, instead of using that, but we have, we have been able to produce these nice sealed bellows as a result, but you know, there's some other considerations that come in hand uh, about the toxicity of what you're working with. We just didn't want to deal with it. Um, next slide, I think. Yeah, so some of the results we've been able to do with these large actuators, we started with the small stuff in the upper left-hand corner, standard finger size or a little bit larger. And then on the right-hand side, you don't have a good scale, but you can tell by the number of convolutions in there, um, this thing is almost like a foot-long hot dog uh, that can wrap around, almost around it entirely itself. And you can see that in the bottom left, that sort of corkscrew behavior that we get out of it. And then if we put them together, thank you, yep, keep going, in an array, um, in a tank, we're starting to grasp things like cylinders, 
Uh, this is here in our own test tank here, URI. This is prior to setting it up on our on an ROV, which we have done before, but this is some early tests to show you that we can wrap around. This is a six inch PVC pipe, I think, right here. Uh, get a good, nice grip on it and we can raise it. We can, we can release it. Um, and all of this can be modeled ahead of time. So the workflow wasn't months to get to this. It was like, I want you to wrap around a six inch cylinder. Uh, can you do that in a couple weeks? And yeah, a couple fails, but um, you know, very quickly we get to a working design that, that comes together right here. Um, I could also say we can put those fingertips on there, which we're working on now. Things that, you know, the idea of, okay, cool, you have 3D printed fingers, but what about the fingernails, you know, and other ways to kind of scrape and grab and pry um, some, some interesting areas for exploration and making that modular so we can add on accessories. Okay, now I'm ready. Thanks. Um, something that, the reason actually I got involved in this stuff in the first place, I'm not an actuator expert um, and I, I've gotten better, I guess, and now I, I can maybe pull that off, but <laughs> I, my background really was in hydraulics and drive systems for the manipulator systems that were normally used on ROVs. And Professor Licht and I worked together early on in taking one of those commercial class hydraulic systems for an ROV, the one that you saw in the Saab Falcon earlier, um, and modifying it to run things at low pressure, um, water and moving water at low pressures to run the jamming gripper that he's showing here, right here. So uh, hydraulic systems on an ROV run at the 1500 to 3000 PSI range. Uh, above ambient. So those are, those are again, are that industrial robotic type thing. They have uh, hydraulic uh, uh, motors and pumps that are running at high pressures and drawing a tremendous amount of power in order to be able to cheese those pressures and flows. Um, uh, and we're actually using those early on to do something much simpler, move uh, maybe, I don't know, a few liters, a, a liter of water or less at 10 to 20 PSI is what we're trying to do. So we started off with a large high pressure hydraulic system driving a low hydraulic system, which is this figure that was published on when we first did this, to, um, go ahead, a much more simple system. And this is really where some of the OER funding that we uh, advanced on uh, went to developing. Um, there was the, the, the hybrid jamming gripper and then also developing this single standalone uh, uh, electrohydraulic system, I'll call it, um, but doesn't have another hydraulic system behind driving it. So this is some sort of device you could plug into a small vehicle or ROV or large ROV, man submersible, um, or potentially even like a diver could swim around with if you're doing shallow water work. We're trying to get it to that one singular device that just has a power plug and maybe some communication into it uh, to drive, in this case, a bellows drive gland. So it's a soft actuator that is then driving another soft actuator. And we want to do that very quickly. So uh, some of the video you saw earlier, for example, we were reaching around um, that pipe and it was very slow, maybe a little hard to watch, right? Come on, get those fingers to move a little bit faster. You can hit play maybe on the next video. Um, this one? Okay. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. you can see that figure, but the video will just be, be just as bad, just as good. Um, and we're trying to get to the point where we can do some much faster actuation, right? Oh, quick, grab it now, snap. You know, that type of reaction time. Um, and that repeated motion. And so you get the idea here, we can use that high speed linear actuator to drive that small bellows, which then drives um, another uh, uh, soft actuator that's connected by that, that hose there. And this has been successful. You're seeing video from anywhere from 1500 to 2000 meters off the coast of Hawaii. Uh, this is in partnership with the Schmidt Ocean Institute, um, but we took the NOAA OER system out on that ROV uh, and we're able to do some interesting uh, demonstrations of grasping, um, you know, bothering deep sea organisms. <laughs> no anemones were harmed in the making of this film. They were just annoyed. Uh, but uh, it, that, that stuff works. And it's if you just flip back really quick um, to look at the one more behind. Yeah, just to look at that, that system, you know, this is slightly larger than a wine bottle type deal. Um, completely oil filled, uh, which means it can go to any depth. If it works at 2000 meters, it'll work at 10,000 meters. Uh, we shouldn't have any problems there. We pushed this system as deep as three, I think on a cruise, 3000 meters there. Um, and we're still employing 3D printing in here. We're doing maybe not so much the manifolds, but we're making these sealed, uh, I don't know if your mouse can move to the center forward and aft sections of this system. Yeah, we're, we're printing the O-ring seals that go into here rather than working with machine shops to do that. So. We can go through quick iterations. That's not big enough. That's not large enough. 
we need another uh, uh, um, hydraulic port in here. Those are just mouse clicks at this point for us. So our, our pathway to development is, is, is moving along very quickly um, to that. Okay, you can go ahead, I guess, to where we left off, which was, oh, not there, but, <laughs> uh, but that's okay. I think we're at a pretty good stopping point for questions. So um, I guess I'll summarize. Um, we, we've developed all these jamming and, and soft actuators and we're doing a lot of 3D printing with it. And we've got pretty good control now of the hydraulic systems that drive them. So uh, this is sort of a great jumping off point for the next project. And we're not quite sure what we want to do next. So um, maybe that picks some interest from the audience. So thanks so much for listening and we'll take questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was very entertaining, even for someone who doesn't always know what you guys are talking about. Um, as a librarian myself, it was highly entertaining. Uh, we did have one question that came in earlier, and I'm not sure if either of you uh, know the answer to this, maybe anecdotally. Uh, does the motion of the boat cause issues with the precision required for 3D printing if you're trying to 3D print on the move? Um, I guess, do you want me to take that, Stephen? Sure, yeah. No, sure. this is right up our wheelhouse. It is, it is. Um, see, see, what is it? Phillips and Licht et al. <laughs> um, it does and it doesn't. It depends on the 3D printer. So we found with the FDM printer or FFF printer, so that's the, the standard hot glue gun on the gantry, your Prusa, your MakerBot, your Ender, um, those are brand names that are used regularly in classrooms and labs for that type of stuff. It doesn't matter. I mean, you could, short of flipping the printer upside down at, on a boat, it's it's fine. Um, and and uh, it, it's really successful. So the stuff basically melts and hardens so quickly that it doesn't really matter. Um, when it comes to the SLA 3D printer stuff, the resin printer, uh, that has to be kept very level because it's in a bath. So A, you don't want that stuff to spill out and you get gooey photopolymer all over your lab and a big mess and ruins your 3D printer. Uh, but the layers also, they, they don't harden quite as quick. Um, and so you'll have these aberrations, you'll have these, these errors in your print um, from ship vibration and the tilting and all that sort of thing. And so we actually, right before the pandemic, had a really crack team of, of students, uh, of undergraduate seniors at URI. Um, and we challenged them with ways to take an SLA 3D printer on a boat. And they worked with uh, some other folks who had some knowledge on gimbals and they made a very large gimbal system uh, and took that 3D printing setup, that whole, uh, on two research cruises. One which was on URI's boat, the Endeavor, and then another which was on NOAA OER's boat um, on the Okeanos Explorer. Uh, and they did a transit. It was a really great tech demo demonstration from, uh, from my recollection, it was from Puerto Rico to South Carolina, right? I uh, thought South Carolina was too, uh, it, was, it wasn't that far. Okay, uh, maybe it was to Florida. Yeah, <laughs> once the pandemic hit, my memory kind of got lost there, right around that time period. But they did get to go to sea on two cruises and test that out and the 3D printer worked. It was really awesome. And I'll, I'll stop talking in a second, but I always think people find this interesting. We thought, cool, great. We can take our 3D printer to sea now and, and, and make our own stuff there with, with the nice printer. That's it. But then we got some really interest, uh, interesting emails and conversations uh, from the Navy Postgraduate Lab um, out on the West Coast. And it turns out the same 3D printers that we're using, these SLA photopolymer resin printers, are very popular in, in dentistry offices. So if you're gonna make dentures, if you're gonna make molds or surgical guides for your teeth, they can 3D scan your mouth. Maybe some of you have had that done to you. Uh, I had Invisalign a few years ago and they, they scanned my mouth, it was nuts. I got to see it, I really geeked out. And then they use these 3D printers to make in a few hours that mold or that modified guide or denture for your, for your teeth. Um, and they can do that with resins that are uh, you know, biocompatible. So there are Navy vessels like aircraft carriers and submarines that go out for months at a time with thousands of sailors on board, at least in the aircraft carrier world, and they have dentists on board and they wanna take those 3D printers out to sea so they can serve, um, serve, serve people on there uh, uh, for, for all those different procedures. And so they were really interested in the fact that we were able to do this with, with, with a gimbal system. Um, and I hope maybe they're doing that now, but at least we know it's possible. No. Uh, you can take that whole thing out to sea, and 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 as a dentist, you can go go to town. So <laughs> and I'll jump in actually. Though, Brent is saying we took it to see if it worked. The way we knew it worked was we actually had the students design and then print uh, two halves of a pressure housing at sea, 
out of a 3D printed material and fastened it together and dropped a pressure, or dropped it down there with a pressure sensor sticking out of it, and got it to I think 300 meters before we, we got scared and brought it back. But it was it was dry inside when uh, when it was done. So that's that's actually turned into a project we do with our my sophomore class. I have them uh, uh, design and print a 3D uh, a 3D printer pressure housing, which we test in uh, uh, Brennan's lab. Uh, doing that for a couple of years now. Yeah, that's been a really positive tangent. I'll, I'll stop talking, Katie. I'm sorry. We, I'm sure we have another question, but it, it is important to highlight that because of this project, getting into that and like the 3D printing at sea and then wait, we should do something practical. How about a pressure housing? Never done that. Oh, it works. Now we can 3D print our own underwater housings and they go thousands of meters deep. It's true. We got like 2000 meter depth rated 3D printed pressure housings that we make all the time in the lab. And it's super empowering. So we don't even design or make them, our students do. You wanna go make something new that goes deep? They just do it. <laughs> they just make it themselves. And that's all tangent off of this work. No, that's awesome. And it does a segue well um, in these in these deep dives. What what is the the coolest things you have collected so far? Oh, um, well, Stephen, have you done any artifacts yet, or is that all in the lab? Just that's all here. in the lab. When we've done deep dives to collect artifacts, we've actually to make sure that we had access to things to try and pick up for uh, for experiments and, and something to publish. We, we'd actually took a little bit of fishing line and we attached a bunch of things to the front porch of the ROV so we could take them down and oh, we yeah. just know that we could do this at 1200 meters or whatever it might be. So we have we picked up a clam, I think, but it wasn't uh, nobody was super excited about that. Yeah. Well, my that that. Artifacts, I think, really, honestly, is where I would love to see this happen. You know, we're, I think Steve and I are itching for that phone call or that email. Like, we have this really awesome deep sea shipwreck and it's got something super delicate. Do you have something that can pick it up? Yes, we do. <laughs> we can make it anywhere we want. And we would love to make a master's project out of that. But <laughs> one of these days, we'll get to that point. Uh, but for the marine biologists in the audience, you may be familiar with something called a xenophyophore. Uh, and if you're not, it's a crazy word for a the world's largest single-celled organism, um, and they're yay big, okay, larger than a golf ball type deal, single-celled deep sea organism that are. I'm trying to describe. How, how can I describe how delicate they are? Um, imagine the most delicate pastry you ever had to pick up. You know, it's almost like crumbling in your hands while you're trying to eat it, um, made out of like really light clay that hasn't been fired yet. That type of thing. Um, we had ROV pilots uh, when we were testing on the Falcor on the ROV Sebastian say, we can't ever pick these things up. We try to grab them with the standard manipulator and they just fall the dust. Um, and we tried it with the soft gripper and no problem. We can pick it up, we can move it around. You know, uh, it, it worked really well. So it's kind of cool to do something that was uh, almost impossible for a standard manipulator. And look, we can do that all day with, with this soft gripper. Awesome, that brings us uh, to another question that just came in. Uh, talking about how fast those uh, those fingers can move, um, how fast were you able to get them to move? Um, our our questioner is uh, thinking about sampling fish, which can move within milliseconds. That is a challenge, but we can move pretty quick. I mean, the video probably didn't come through super. Hard. Do you want to flip back real quick? No. See if I can find Give it a shot. Here. See if you can get a sense here. I know that there's some lag and stuff, but. The first few seconds of this video, see how quick that snap is? You know, it's less than a second for that movement to occur. So we're really limited at that point at how fast the electric actuator can move, which is pretty darn quick. Um, snapping the fish, uh, maybe a slow fish, <laughs> but um, that's that that's that's a tough one. Yeah, um, but we can move quick. You know, for me, it's more about you know you're, you're usually with an ROV you. You might be hovering off the bottom or man submersible. So there's a moment in time where you're right where you're at your target. And if you're going too slow, everything else will have moved. So for the pilot, it serves you to be within that one second movement time because we're there, let's do it, grab it, and go really quick. You know, that lag time for the human interaction, I think we're at that point where it, it, yeah, we could we can match that. But uh, a fish, I don't know. There's some other tricks up there. <laughs> Yes, I I guess so, and I, that that leads me to my maybe my last question is since thinking of fish and thinking of Noah and what Noah does with the oceans and the coasts, um, where do you see these uh, soft uh, robotics working 
with what NOAA, NOAA's mission is. Steve, you want to go? Yeah, so I, the, our first target, or at least my first target when I started getting into this was, was in the archaeology and the artifact recovery. Um, and so Brennan's more on the sort of biology side of things, but that, that's been the, the audience that I've gotten the most feedback from. Um, you know, I'll, I'll show a video, I'll say, well, what about this? And I say, well, you can't use that because that relies on a hard bottom. So, well, what about this? Well, you can't use that because of certain types of stress. So that's been, for me, the best feedback I've gotten is, is from a marine archeologist who are thinking about artifact recovery. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's uh, something that we, the hardest part is to bring together the technology and the, the, the problem and, and the crews and, and the timing to get everything to work. And the two times we've, we've been close uh, have been uh, canceled at the last minute, unfortunately. So it's been, uh, it's been a little frustrating, but we think that uh, part of it is, you know, these are, these are non-renewable resources, right? You, you, you screw it up once, you're, you're, you're going to, um, uh, sort of, there'll be a black mark on the, the name of soft robotics. So we, we do want to, to at least show our capability on something that uh, would, would normally not be approached or would, would be much lo you know, longer evolution to try and to, to grasp a target. So uh, we're, I think we're kind of waiting for that big opportunity where we can say, look, we did this, no one else could. Uh, and that we hope would open up more doors for, um, for future expeditions. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'll just follow it along with a quick anecdote that when Stephen and I got really started in soft robotic work, right around 2015-ish, I would say, at least that's when I started collaborating with you on this type of work. In 2014, um, I was an ROV pilot. Uh, you were on that cruise too, Stephen. We went out to the Monterey Shipwreck, uh, mm -hmm. which is a really interesting shipwreck in U.S. waters in the Gulf of Mexico. It's about 1,400 meters deep, loaded with artifacts, and it was an OER-sponsored uh, artifact uh, recovery cruise on that wreck. And I don't know if OER has done an artifact recovery cruise since, maybe they have, but um, that was the last trip we were on. And this shipwreck, just to describe you, it, it had really cool things. It had dinner plates and cups, and it had uh, old guns, munitions type thing that was kicking around there. And then there were these sand clocks or hourglasses that were delicate, right? These double-sided um, glass sand clocks with the sand in them and everything uh, that just looked so delicate and we collected one of them and it was in it was done using a, a, a dustpan how we're going to pick this thing up and we have this large manipulator right big, big metal stainless steel and aluminum manipulator touching the glass that wasn't going to work so we took like a metal dustpan right put that right next to it and sort of like scraped it in did it but it was it was sketchy you know I, i'm surprised it worked out and now I, I just keep thinking back to that moment, like if only we had this soft gripper stuff then, it was like the next year that we started getting into it. That would have been you know, very well suited for that and many other artifacts on that wreck. So uh, we need to go back. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Phillips and Licht. This has been awesome. I don't see any more questions from our audience. So I'm going to uh, say that we can end here and give everyone back a little bit of their time and let you guys get back to your classes. And um, I just remind everyone that we did record this. If you do want to uh, listen to it again, send it on to a colleague. You can find that on the library's YouTube channel. Um, and I do want to remind everyone that uh, NOAA uh, Ocean Exploration has another seminar uh, with the library coming up on the 22nd. Um, question is, might retaining in situ pressure during sampling change our view of deep ocean life? So please look out for that presentation coming up on the 22nd. And I just wanna thank again our speakers and I hope everyone has a safe and lovely rest of their Wednesday. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Katie.